This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you. Oh, so, so many memories. I'm almost, you know, almost at the point of tears here because I think I did my last seminar here thir almost 30 years ago um, talking about some of the same data that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and also a little known fact, for Marvin, that um, you didn't know. Uh, today's my 30th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we uh, we celebrated this weekend because you know that's how life goes. But um, yeah, so it's it's just amazing. There's lots of memories here in Ithaca because we met met here. Um, so I'm going to take you a little bit of a journey of of uh, some of the work that I've done here and um, talk to you about caneberries mostly. Although I do a lot of strawberry work as well. So um, so yeah, the, oh, let me go back here too. The, the raspberries can't take the heat, but blackberries can. So. There's a story here, and I talk about raspberries can't take in the heat almost 30 years ago, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit. Um, but blackberries can. Um, there's a whole sort of story behind the story. Um, probably a better title for this is Building a Caneberry Industry in North Carolina, but I really wanted to tie it back to some of the stuff that we did here many years ago. Um, so Marvin got it all right. I, you know, I got my BS in biology from Ripon College. Um, from got a master's degree from Minnesota, did um, cold hardiness in apples with Dr. Emily Hoover, got a PhD at, here with Marvin many years ago in raspberry physiology. And then what he didn't say is that I did a post master's pre doc at the University of Arkansas where as a technician, but I worked in berry breeding there with um, John Clark and Jim Moore. And that was also, a, you know, it's another degree there because I learned a whole lot and that certainly helped me with my, my current job. Um, and cane berries. Um, so my activities are, are wide. I am an extension specialist in 30 or 70% extension most of the time that I've been in North Carolina. Worked on a lot of um, applied type of research, strawberry production issues, methyl bromide alternatives. That was a big thing when I first got to North Carolina. Got a lot of grants and got my tenure based on methyl bromide alternatives. Worked on row covers and cover crops. Then also did some applied caneberry research. And when I first started, we called it brambles. Um, everybody familiar with that term? And a lot of the growers still call them brambles, but we now call them caneberries, which are the blackberries and the raspberries. Um, yeah, I'm also a breeder, wear many hats, and release a couple of cultivars, um, Nantahala and Vaughn. I'll talk about them a little later. Also released most recently two strawberries, Rockwell and Liz. Not going to talk about them at all, but they're nice strawberries. Check them out sometime. And then also a director of graduate programs, similar to the DGS, I guess, here. So um, talk about that a little bit as well. So how many of you were born in, I guess I can't ask this, but um, you know, you're probably born in if, after 1999, I guess. No, okay. So around that time, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, because that's my kids, my kids are about your age. Um, so this article came out in 1999 in Prevention Magazine, a really big magazine. All the baby boomers are getting old, they're trying to, or they're starting to retire, they're interested in health benefits. And this article came out, it was a seminal article. It was very influential in the, in the berry world and in the aging world. Prevention Magazine, it says, Miracle Berry, want to stop aging, live longer, and keep your smile, make blueberries a habit. So this was uh, important, uh, a turning point in the berry industry. People are interested in berries in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and people are jumping on the berry bandwagon. When I was here at Cornell, people, they ate berries, mostly locally produced strawberries shipped in from California, but there weren't berries available in the winter time. It wasn't a year round crop. So things were really starting to change with this interest in being healthy and ability to produce berries shipping out of uh, the Southern climates of so Chile and Mexico, et cetera. Oh, I bet you I didn't turn this thing on. I did not. So hopefully in the out there in Zoom land, you can hear me now. Um, so that article came out in 1999. Go ahead, turn this one off. Okay. Um, and just about that same time, this these data are a little bit old. I just want to show you what's going on there. And the, this is some data from a, a, a berry farm, global berry farms. The industry status from 2000 to 2004. Um, if you look at those different categories of berries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries, strawberries are definitely the big berry one, you know, that's noticeable there. But if you look at each one of those other categories, you'll see that berry sales increases in each one of them. And the total berry category, if you added them all together, between those four years, 
total berry sales are going up 70 percent so berries are really kicking in people are becoming more interested in them and it's a thing you know berries are definitely a thing you see them all over the place in the grocery stores and people eating them becoming more and more popular um just there's a lot of data here and this one is a little bit old and i tried to go over to man library and update this just now but was not able to access this data but this is from the strawberry commission in california 2017 if you look at that pie chart right there just want you to focus on that one you think of your big pile of all the the, the produce or the berries or the fruits that are available in the grocery store um and it's 100 percent berries are 20 percent of the sales in grocery stores each year and it's still that case i was able to find out that it's still about 20 percent um, um apples which i know are big here 13 percent grapes 11 percent but berries as a group strawberries blackberries blueberries and raspberries are 20 percent of sales in grocery stores um, every year okay so timing was ideal for a, a new industry in north carolina um, and another piece of this puzzle was the tobacco industry was changing in north carolina when i first moved down there tobacco was king everybody grew tobacco people had tobacco um, allotments their farms lots of small farmers had these allotments and that's what their families survived on for years and years so right when it came down to the tobacco settlement was approved by you know, the state federal government and they were paying growers to to sell their allotments um, the tobacco was still there by the way and just bigger growers but the smaller growers were looking to get out of that tobacco and trying to grow something else or really an interest in north carolina to grow alternative crops so Perfect timing for a new faculty member to come down and start looking at things. And I love berries and I wanted to see what we could do with berries. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna go back a little bit to uh, this exact slide appeared in this same room, probably a, maybe a different screen 30 years ago. And um, this was sort of one of the biggest findings of my, my PhD research. So I worked with Todd Dawson and Marvin Fritz and Todd had a nice, photosynthesis machine over in the ecology what is that department well, the ecology of Bush, yeah 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 so it's across the street so i brought in some raspberry plants and put them in this this um, big chamber and hooked on that uh, photosynthesis machine on those leaves and started them off at a 15 degree centigrade you guys all know what that is i don't have to translate it to fahrenheit and then slowly increase the temperature and over time um the the photosynthetic efficiency of those plants or the capacity of those plants just went down uh this right here is 68 degrees probably common here in ithaca in the summer 68 degrees in raleigh north carolina never happens in the summer not even at night you know we don't even get that cool at night so you know it was going to be a real struggle for getting raspberries to grow in north carolina um so this is if you look in that book marvin is page 56 just to make sure and it's also in i think we published it in, in uh, the journal of horticulture science or whatever too but i, I looked it up the other day it was still there and I, we just went over to the library and it's the thesis isn't there anymore it's, it's in the end so yeah, it's really disappointing but i've been around a long i guess too long i moved them up um but you know so 86 degrees is more like our summer temperatures and you see that photosynthetic uh, capacity of the plants are not really good blackbirds used to do the same thing they're happy and they'll, they'll be very um, productive. Um, so, you know, I knew this going down into this job and I worked in, uh, I was initially stationed at an off-campus research station in Eastern North Carolina. It was very hot and steamy in the summer and those are the temperatures down there at the bottom. So they're in the 90s and during the summer, um, all summer long. <coughs> so I believe it was Marvin that gave me some advice, you know, so you've got this new job, just collect some baseline data you, know, you don't know a lot don't assume anything just get some good baseline data and go in there and and figure out the crops before you start doing anything fancy so we put in some variety trials all across the state um both in caneberry blackberry and raspberry because i thought well you know this that chart that i did maybe it's really not the case you know maybe they do survive so i bought a bunch of different raspberries and blackberries and planted them out and i'd also been at university of arkansas so i wanted to try those blackberries there and see how they did in North Carolina because nobody was really growing in that. So uh, let's just do that. Um, so we see those berries on the eastern. This is where I was located in eastern North Carolina. Um, this is Raleigh, where I'm at right now. This is a upper Piedmont research station where they were growing a lot of tobacco. So they were looking at alternatives out there. And this is Mills River or um, Hendersonville area where 
the research station, uh, Fletcher, it used to be called, is located. So we put some trials out there. So, you know, three different geographic zones and growing con conditions in those three different locations. So just wanted to see how they did. And I did take a lot of data on those. And that data exists on slides. I converted those slides to a, a, a disk. And I don't have a way to read that disk when I was trying to make this, this talk. So, you know, it's several generations removed. But believe me, you know, we did the trials. Blackberries did great. Raspberries, not so much. Um, and especially those University of Arkansas blackberries did really well. So, and then the black, raspberries did well up in the mountains too. And we'll see some more pictures of them as we go along. Okay, so but there was also a grower, Irvin Weinberg. You um, may not know him, but he was a just a really sweet man. He was the largest blackberry grower in the state at that time. He was growing the thorny blackberries from the University of Arkansas, which are really nasty. And that, when I was there, that's mostly what we were growing. Although we started to grow some of the, really some of the, or they started to release some of the thornless ones. Um, so he was growing them and, and I stopped by, he, you know, he would call me a lot. I was like, so excited that I was there working on cane berries, working on blackberries, come and see my trot, you know, my plantings. Um, Kaya was the primary cultivar that he really liked. Um, it was a thorny as all heck, um, but he marketed everything himself. He was the largest grower at the time. He had about 20 acres. Um, so just, it was a, that grower that I worked with a lot and you'll see that he, he comes up again. So it's really important as an extension person to make these connections to the, the growers out there. And he was an important player in that. Gina, could in this my, be related, this guy related to uh, Dan Weinberger? Yeah, absolutely, his brother. It's his brother? Yes, yes, there's all, they're all over the place. And there's another brother that's also a grower to him. Um, yeah, so yeah, very yeah, nice. Point out that. Yeah, Dan was. Um, Dan was, yes, yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, Irvin was an NC State grad, and Irvin has a PhD. He was a, a education a, a education. So growers, but also um, you know tied to agriculture and the families from that area there too. So just very knowledgeable guy, very forward thinking. So I decided to do some more trials, and these are we have eighteen research stations across NC State. Um, I about this same time, no, but I'm still living out here in Eastern North Carolina, but they, there was really a lot of interest. So I put a lot more trials across the state um, and several different iterations of them. We did also, tunnels were becoming popular too. So we grew uh, cane berries and tunnels and we had the same trial in the tunnel and outside because people didn't believe that, you know, what, you know, what's the difference? So I had mirror studies where we had all of them inside and outside, all across the state. So there's a lot of driving involved. Um, and this is just something that I want to point to you. This is not the ideal trial, but this is actually looking at the harvesters of these different blackberries. And these are the different cultivars here. So Arapaho, Natchez, Wachita, these are all the thornless types now. Uh, Apache, NC430, which is Vaughn, my variety, my, my and Jim Ballington's. Navajo, uh, uh, thornless types. And then Triple Crown, I think, is a USDA. And then Chester, some older stuff too that people were familiar with, both thornless too. So these are all thornless types. And we grow them in these different locations. This is Ox, Oxnard or Oxford, Salisbury, and then Salisbury in the tunnel too. So you can just see there are different locations all across the state. Um, but I want to show right here is the harvest state. So they were interested in when can these different varieties be grown? So and because we had so many different locations, we could span, we could span from early June all the way through you know, the middle of August there. So that was really important for that potential industry to grow. And especially here at the end, we had a lot of cultivars coming in late and that'll come in here to play a little bit. So when I first got there, maybe a hundred acres and that was a lot, that's just the number that was told to me, um, you know, when 1996 to 2000, did all those cultivar trials, talked to the University of Arkansas, told them, hey, blackberries do really good here, just FYI. Um, the consumer demand was increasing, did a lot of extension talks and talked around um, and things started to happen. Um, Sunny Ridge Farm had heard about the trials in North Carolina and John Clark, the breeder from the University of Arkansas said, hey, I think you should go to North Carolina and you know, they, they might have something for you there. So they, at the time, were one of the first market, large marketers that were growing blackberries, and they were also growing blueberries, um, mostly in Mexico and Georgia, so, South Georgia, but they wanted to extend their season, so they needed some late um, ripening blackberries. 
So um, they came to North Carolina and they said, you know, can you help? They went to extension and said, can you help us? So we had set up a series of meetings with help, uh, Farm Bureau helped um, organize them as well. And within several, just a couple of months, a lot of growers had signed contracts with Sunny Ridge Farms. And there was probably within two years, another 400 acres had gone in in Western North Carolina. And I was like, now these growers, they don't know how to grow blackberries. They're starting a new market and it's, it's you know, a large commercial market. And is it gonna work? Urban Lineberger was a saint in that respect because he really helped those growers held their hands. Um, you know, I did as much as I could too, but it was really a nice relationship to work with that grower and have that industry grow. And him, him being, he was actually out there too, helping those growers with the day-to-day -day maintenance of things too. Um, and they started harvesting in 2007. Um, so in the background, what I was doing as well, we had lots of grower meetings. So the, a lot of growers weren't sure how to do things, how to prune things. So we had a lot of those types of workshops, lots of agent trainings as well. Um, uh, on-farm trials, we were doing uh, with these growers, we we're doing some on-farm trials, both myself and entomologists and plant pathologists trying to get you know, our presence there on, on their farms. We developed several budgets. Um, for how much does it cost to produce blackberries? Because these growers actually signed these contracts without really knowing how much money they would make, which was a little scary. So we put together budgets pretty quickly with Charles Safley um, and, and uh, using different trellis systems and everything. Developed several production guides. This was the second iteration. There's actually a third iteration out right now. It's not, we don't have a hard copy or a pretty picture of it yet, but um, developed those as well. Um, diagnostic tools, whether there's a blackberry diagnostic tool, like Marva has the raspberry and the strawberry diagnostic tool. So we have one too. It's actually linked to the Cornell site as well. So, you know, I've got some white droplets on the berries. What is it? So growers can look at that on their computer and or their, their uh, phone and, and try to figure out what's going on with that. Um, did a lot of fertility surveys. The, the fertility recommendations in North Carolina were established for um, blackberries that were grown in the early uh, 1900s. So they were making recommendations for some wild blackberries. And so the, you know, we, we had to come up with a new set of recommendations, how, what fertility recommendations to put out there. So we did a lot of those. Um, and first of all, just did surveys. Um, and then also helped the nursery industry get going too in the National Clean Plant Network nursery. So. Lots of growers are buying new plants. They are interested in getting these North Carolina or these um, University of Arkansas varieties. They're buying them from nurseries from everywhere. They're just getting all these blackberries, and they were growing outside in these nursery conditions where these these nurserymen weren't sure what they were doing. They were just propagating, and they had a lot of viruses. And so we determined that oh, we, there's a whole slew of viruses. We did a virus survey. Um, we contacted. There was a micropropagation unit at NC State that was working to a virologist that was working to clean up sweet potatoes. And I said, can you look at the blackberries? I think there's a problem there. Um, and from that, yes, yes, indeed, we had a graduate student survey of lots of blackberry viruses. Um, and we determined that it's probably not a good thing to buy your plants from a nursery that product, produces them out in the field because those plants will come into your, into your production system loaded with viruses, um, figured out a way to grow them in tissue culture, National Clean Plant Network evolved from that and multiple other things at the same time. So that also occurred at that same time. So um, we that industry would have sunken um, if we hadn't got a clean plant nursery going at that same time as well. Um, so the current status in that blackberry industry, and there, there's just so many stories behind that, I can't go through them all, but I think it's about 800 acres. We don't officially collect data on blackberries in North Carolina. They, they're a new enough industry and they're small enough in general that um, they don't want to share that information. It's really hard to dial that in. At least 800 acres, I think, probably maybe close to 1,000. Um, mostly using the Arkansas varieties like um, Wachita, Ponca, Natchez, um, and uh, some of the newer ones as well. Um, and then Vaughn, a variety that we've released from NC State, especially in East or Western North Carolina, the growers really like it and it does really well and it tastes better than in Arkansas varieties and you, yields better too. So we're very happy with Vaughn. Um, you know, a lot of the big major companies are there as well as Nature Ripe, Driscoll's, Wish Farms, um, North Bay. So a lot of those, if you go to the, to the grocery store and see those clamshells with those, those company names on them, you know, you'll see those names there as well. 
Um, and what's interesting is this, this industry has developed in the western part of the state, they grow all their blackberries outside. So they have you know open air, they're out in the fields and they're beautiful. This is my, one of my favorite farms right here. This is South and Rose's farm in Hendersonville, um, all grown outside. Eastern North Carolina, they're a little bit more tech friendly, I would say, and they grow everything under tunnels and it rains a little bit more in Eastern North Carolina. So they wanna be able to harvest those berries every single day they don't out here if it rains you know they, they can't go out there they you know good but they usually let them go for a day um but so there's a, a kind of a difference a cultural difference in how they grow things but we had that you know that that uh, tunnel trial data so we knew how those things were produced in both night areas and said yep they're, they're, they do well um a little fun fact about that is that the yield's not that much higher for blackberries under tunnels for raspberries it is um but it's just that protection that you get from the rain that really felt, they felt that was um, important to them. <clears throat> okay, so this is the status of the current industry. I did a survey a couple of years ago, um, developed for the pest management strategic plan for the region. And you can see the darker counties. This is the Eastern growers here that have <coughs> the tunnels. This is this area right here. And this right, this county, these counties right here are the major of the, the Western, but they're still, fairly big um, growers in the other counties as well. There's a hundred counties in the state um, and mostly a commercial shipping industry. Uh, you can see that these lighter shaded ones, there's so local production there for local markets and things as well. Okay, so remember when I talked about that yield data when we harvested blackberries in North Carolina and we had some that were uh, producing really late in the season in, in August. So this map, I'm going to walk you through a little bit. So this is select fresh blackberry shipments to the U.S. market over several different years, 2019, 2020, 21, and 22. The black line here represents the uh, shipping point price. So this is price during these years. Um, and these are the different locations. So you can see Oxnard, California. Uh, that color of green is Mexico. So a lot of berries coming out of Mexico, especially in the winter. Um, uh, Georgia is this darker blue right here. And then the gray is North Carolina. So we actually, we're on the map here. You can see starting here in 2019, North Carolina coming into production here. Prices are really good. Same thing next in 2020. 2020 was a really good year. The pandemic year was really good. The prices were really good. Um, and 2021 prices weren't as good. A um, lot of other factors going on here, but it's still the prices were um, increasing when we are into big production. So that was really nice. They like those really late season varieties because they can make more money. And and, and um, Mexico is out by that time and Georgia is out too, because that's our main competitor is Georgia right at this time. <clears throat> Um, this is one of my favorite growers here, James Webb Wish Farms. You know, these are large growers. They have shipping facilities, and distribution facilities, and cooling facilities. He grows probably the most lawn. I think he has close to 50 acres of lawn. Um, the, the current uh, uh, conservative estimate of the industry is at least $12 million. Some budgets say closer to $50 million. Um, so that's cash value to the farmer. Um, and there's added value, and I don't know what the shipping value is, but but that's about what it is, the impact it has in the local counties. Most of it is fresh, so it's shipped in those containers and shipped fresh. And some counties you can't even buy locally produced blackberries because these guys just want to ship those berries. You can see that they're all in these containers there. Um, some is used for um, local sales, so some of the growers, and about 20% of every of every crop too, is just not suitable because they're very strict regulations on what is a, a marketable blackberry. So if it has one of those white droplets, Used to be one was okay, two was not. They're a little bit more lenient with that right now. Um, but about 20% of it is not marketable. So they use other products. They make um, juice and wine and, and uh, syrups and things like that. Especially in the mountains, they, they work really well for that. Um, so this is what, you know, if you were, this looks like here in California where you have big shipping uh, distribution centers, big cooling centers. They have, uh, you know, pick the berries in the field. It's really hot in the summer, even in the mountains. And they have cooling, cool bots right here. And they load up those bots up, take them down to the cooler and um, get those berries cool ASAP. <clears throat> and this is a little, just a plug for Vaughn Blackberry released in 2012. It took a long time for it to catch on. 
because the University of Arkansas breeding program is so stinking big. And John Clark, has anybody ever seen John Clark talk? Yes. So you know, he sings and he talks and he tells these great stories and it's just really hard to compete with that kind of salesmanship. Um, but Vaughn was planted, it, it hung in there. Um, the growers started catch, you know, and word of mouth by growers really helped this one catch on in, in Western North Carolina. It's thornless, it's late season. And that fits into that late season window really well, even better than any of John's stuff because he was trying to get early season. So you know, it was just the, the alignment of the stars for Vaughn. Um, very high yield. It doesn't yield really high the first year, so everybody's really disappointed. But the second and third year, it's very does very very well. Um, tolerant to many diseases. A lot of the Arkansas stuff will get orange rust and and other diseases, and Vaughn just will hang in there and not get them. Very good in post harvest trials. And in fact, Penny Perkins Vesey is uh, the post harvest physiologist that I worked with, and she said, and I said, I, you know, I'm not going to release it. I can't compete with the University of Arkansas. And she said, no, it does has really good post harvest, you know, traits. Go ahead and release it. Okay, so I did, um, and it does really well in North, Western North Carolina and in Europe. It's really catching on for long cane production of blackberries. It's really doing well there. I'm very excited about that prospect. Okay. Um, some more pictures of Vaughn. Got to show off my kid a little bit here. The first picture of it in flower there. That's in New Jersey. It does really well here. So. You know, every single flower there is a berry, so it's it's really loaded up. A pretty picture of Vaughn and, and then Vaughn <laughs> in the cooler there, ready to ship. There's still challenges with the industry. Labor is number one, but you know, by far, it's just hard to get the labor. Um, one grower last year just had to shut down his whole, whole big farm because he just didn't have enough um, labor to pick it all. This is a very intense harvest schedule there. It's very hot. Um, we've actually done night harvest studies to see if that would work, and it works. But those growers aren't quite ready to shift their their whole labor to that situation, but I don't think that's far away. Um, we do have spring injury right here in the in the spring. Almost every other year or so, we get damage from frost to the the buds, and we thought the first year it happened uh, in 2007. We got a frost on Easter weekend. That was actually a couple days after that. You can see that receptacle has browned and just like a strawberry, that's not going to produce any fruit. Um, but funny thing about blackberries that I didn't know at the time, they have secondary buds and those secondary buds broke out and they have maybe 20 to 30 percent less yield, but then they're later. So that's even a good thing. So some growers sometimes like to have that little bit of injury to their you know, first um, uh, flowering set of uh, buds because then they can push their crop a little bit later if the prices are good, but they do lose a little bit of yield. So it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. And then they got to play with it. Uh, lots of pests, spotted wing drosophila. We have lots of boars. We have cane dieback. There's a lot of diseases that came in. There's always something. You know, you think you get something figured out. We had, um, one of the cool things about the, the thornless types was they were resistant to double blossom, which was a disease that limited the production. University of Arkansas, the thornless type for some magical reason, they're resistant to double blossom. So that opened up a whole new option there. So we, you know, but we, we started using all of those. And then um, and then we get this cane dye back, and then we get spider wing drosophila. So it's always something right now. And the genomia, which is a, our, our big problem right now, it's up and coming. So we might hear more about that. And Sarah Villani, a graduate from uh, Cornell here working with me on um, that genomia. She just sent me that last week that she figured out what it was. Um, so now I want to transition, but I want to show you this was one of the earliest pictures I took. Climbed up in the middle of the blackberry canopy and a bee trellis, took a picture looking into the blackberry side. Um, so this is, you know, I, you know, I built it was the, 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 the stars were aligned for to help build this industry. It wasn't all me, the things, you know, all happened at the same time. Um, the breeding, I have developed some heat tolerant floricane fruiting raspberries. I'm not going to talk about that a whole lot, but I'm going to talk about the repercussions of that. We do have primocane fruiting cultivars that do well in the mountains as well. Um, I'm going to talk about one of them as well. Done a lot of cultural studies, um, row covers and tunnel and pruning and, uh, to get the harvest season earlier and later based on some of Marvin's stuff. And some of the growers are doing that too, cutting down their primocanes to try to delay their, their primocane blackberry harvest. Um, and long canes, 
blackberries. We also do breeding. So we're mostly for fluorocane fruiting, farmless blackberries. And we still have a couple that were trial and we're in the later stages of development. We want high quality late season. And now that I know that I can compete with the University of Arkansas, I think we're going to release a couple more that we had in, in the docket there. And then also cultural studies, we did a lot with um, blackberries as well. So just a lot of things going on, uh, a lot of data that we want to show you. These are some breeding trials there on the left. These are rubus breeding plots. You can see within those rows, a lot of variation in. This is mostly raspberries. You can see some more vigor in some of these plots, but less vigor. So we know just through this is very, I'm a very traditional breeder, just through sheer force of surviving out in that field. You know, these guys are probably not going to be real adaptive, but some of these right down here in this row are. So we do have a couple selections that um, look pretty good and will hopefully be releasing. These are uh, raspberries up in the mountains, high elevation, 30. 200 feet, so almost comparable to Cornell in the, uh, the, the climate there, maybe more like Pennsylvania. But raspberries do really well up in the mountains there. And, um, <clears throat> so there's still a potential for industry there. And we're doing some trials with um, North Bay to see if we can um, get some raspberries because they want raspberry shipping with their blackberries at the same time um, out to all these different locations to work with them. So um, as some part of Courtney Weber's um, we're trying some kid material out there too. Um, just to show you a little bit of the breeding challenge here for raspberries. So florcate fruiting raspberries. A um, mandarin is a variety that was released a long time ago. Um, it's probably the most heat tolerant. It's got some Chinese um, background in it. Heat tolerant, but you can see that berry is really crumbly, not really good. So we re recommend that for homeowners only. Um, Latham is an old, old variety. I think from the 1800s from uh, Minnesota. Um, for some reason, it does really well. Um, and NC344 is one of our uh, selections. Um, NC344, this is one of its parents. You can see it's much better as far as the fruit quality right there. And Gleb Prozen, I couldn't find a picture of that one, but you can just see that you know, we've got some improvement in the fruit um, uh, quality. Um, and we know that they do best in the mountains from our earlier trials. Um, so we have some adapt adaptation to heat, but the quality is still a problem during the summer heat. Imagine that little soft raspberry pulling it off its receptacle there. It's a soft little thing. You squish it a little bit, you know, because when you pull, um, and it's just in the middle of the summer, it's hard to keep that quality going. And even the size, so these are, this is a, uh, a selection. This is, these are two locations, Salisbury and the Sandhills. They're about 90, 90 miles apart. This is a much hotter location. And consistently, the fruit size is smaller when it's hot, too. So it's still a problem during the heat. Um, we can grow them, and the plants have some heat tolerance. They, I think if I, I put them, took them over to uh, across the, the road here and put them in photosynthesis machine, they would probably be a little more tolerant um, than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but is there another way? So, you know, how else could we produce raspberries? Because it still is my favorite small fruit crop. But, uh, I could share that with this audience here, though I work on all those other ones there. It's just a nice flavor berry. Um, so how could we produce fruit at the same time as strawberries in North Carolina and beyond? You know, so how can we do this? Well, um, and how can we increase the fruit offerings in early spring? So we have strawberries. We do, you know, commercial industry of strawberries. And, and one of the growers uh, approached me and said, I want to produce all four berries at the same time on my farm. So blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, or blackberries, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, and raspberries. We wanted the raspberries were impossible. Um, so the grower is Cal Lewis, another big grower in, in Eastern North Carolina. Um, and he came to me and I said, you know, I've tried it before. I think we could try it again. I said, it will come in at the same time as the strawberries. And he said, let's go for it. Because he'd been to, he grows through Driscoll's and he'd been to California and he'd been to Mexico and he'd been to Europe where they do a lot of this long cane raspberries. He said, I think we want to try it here and I want you to do it on my farm and I want to work cooperatively with extension. I want it to be an extension activity. And I said, that's right. Um, so he donated the land. Um, we got the tunnels donated. And at the same time, I had a young woman who is an extension agent down there, uh, Lisa Raver, said, I want to do a master's degree with you. And she lived like about 45 minutes away from this on-farm trial. But uh, I said, Lisa, 
I've got a project for you, and we're going to talk about long cane raspberries, you know, and I talked to her a little bit about, about the project, and she she hung up the phone, and she told me one, she hung up the phone, that as soon as I hung up the phone, I, I googled long cane raspberry. I had no idea what you were talking about, and now she's the expert of long cane raspberry in North Carolina. So we started this project um, uh, during the pandemic. We wanted to grow long cane raspberries. We had some, you know, information. It's been done in different locations. Um, it's a long cane raspberry. It's a one-year-old cane that's grown in another location. It's ready to fruit that year. Um, you grow them in pots, and they will produce a season that first year. And it's an annual crop. It's you know, grow it again. So that's a lot of money. That grower Cal Lewis has a lot of money. He was willing to invest in this because he wants to grow four berries in his farm. That's the ones they make money. Do, do they come as uh, as bare roots then? They so they have. Them. They actually grow them. Here's a picture of them. They grow them. Um, in, in these pots right here in either Quebec or in, um, this is actually in, in um, Western North Carolina, they're as a nursery trying to grow them there. So they grow them in those pots. They uh, ship them in these pots. They bring, ship them in, um, they call them, them coffins and they're in cooler. They put them in coolers and they arrive at the destination location. Um, and then you plant them or you, you have a pullout date. You pull them out and put them in tunnels in January. Did I explain that okay to you? Okay. Um, yeah, so that's that sequence basically there. And then fruit is harvested that summer. But it's still challenging because you have to put plant them in January, plant them, you pull them out in January. Um, so you got a January still cold in North Carolina. You got to close them up. You got to use you know, you know the, the doors on the tunnels. You have to use row covers on that bottom picture. You can see that we had a double um, cover them because it just got so cold at sometimes. Um, and fortunately, because this is an on farm trial, we had a lot of labor to help out with this. We probably wouldn't have been able to do this at a research station. And the other challenge we had is pine bark. Could we use pine bark instead of coconut core? Because coconut core is one that they use in, in traditionally in Europe and in California and in Mexico. Um, but we wanted a, a alternative, something that was locally uh, produced. So a little bit of background on soilless um, uh, new crop or soilless substrates. Um, cane berries are amongst the most recent types of crops that use this uh, substrates for for growing our plants. Um, the nursery industry has for a long time used different substrates and they kind of base it on what is locally available. So we had a professor at NC State, Brian Jackson, who knew how to grow stuff in substrates and wanted to expand into other crops. And he said, I think we have some opportunities in, in North Carolina, I think, um, uh, or some opportunities with alternate substrates. And um, this was at the same time, about 2020, everybody remember that year? Um, and we were starting this project and we couldn't get the coconut core. It wasn't available. The um, supply chain was just all locked up. So um, you know, like once again, the, the stars aligned and we had, okay, so let's go see if we can get some locally produced substrates, pine bark in, in North Carolina. Um, and I guess I kind of jumped ahead of myself here. So if there's anything else I'm missing there. Um, so it's been, been known and used on other crops. Um, and these are the two options that we had, pine bark or coconut core. Cocoa core was industry standard in Europe and California or Canada, sourced from Sri Lanka mostly. Uh, it has excellent water holding capacity. You know, people have worked with this for many years, so they know how to use it. Um, and it, it worked out the, the, the fertility with it. Um, and a good supplier is necessary. It costs about eight to 10 times as much as the locally produced pine bark. So that's a lot of difference between those two. Um, pine bark, it was produced locally. We have a lot of pines in North Carolina. There's some um, mulch, um, mulch distributors that have worked with us with the nursery industry in North Carolina for a long time and really are able to dial in the size of your particulate in that, in that pine bark and really able to um, deliver you a consistent product. So they figured out how to do that. It has, a, it's a little bit trickier. It's not the same as a coconut core. So we, that was mostly what we were doing is learning how to grow it in pine bark. We had different fertility issues, um, but he was willing or they were willing to supply that with us you know, every year. So it was really um, locally producing. 
So in Sri Lanka, it was an hour and a half drive away from this, this grower. So, uh, and this is the season, what it would look like. I'm, gonna, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. You know, so you plant it out, pull it out in January, starts to leaf out, see a lot of activity. And these are just really consistent plants. Look at these, um, you know, there's laterals coming out very consistently there. Um, really beautiful fruit. It's humming with bees and just a really nice um, fruit harvest there too. And that's Quelly uh, raspberry, red raspberry that we found out. It wasn't the best flavor, but it was the most consistent quality in that system for us. Um, so this is what the system looks like. Uh, you know, so very high density in the, in the tunnel. I think they're 18 inches apart. Uh, that's some of the fruit, very high quality fruit. They harvested all the fruit for us and they sold it on the farm. Um, don't know if it's gonna be a commercial shipping industry, but it is a nice local um, crop that will um, complement your strawberry production. Okay, so the one of the, 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 the things that Lisa always says, can pine bark do the job? Is it gonna work for us? So we know it costs eight to 10 times less. This was the yield data, and this is the second data, data table that I'm showing you today and, and not too complicated. Um, Coconut core versus pine bark, essentially the same yield. So it was, you know, it can do the job. It, pine bark works just fine. And it's eight times less. So it's, um, it's like it's gonna work out for us. Um, so is this another new crop for North Carolina? This is the, you know, the, this is the first year that we've ever actually said, yes, we think it can be. We're working on the budget still to see if it works out. It might not work out for every grower, but it really has worked out for this grower. And we think there's a lot of other larger growers that are looking for a raspberry crop to sell at the same time as their strawberries. They can get fruit quality be consistent and maybe able to ship them as well. Um, and we know that pine bark works. It's a little bit trickier. And we also know that it's cheaper. All right, so yeah, so this is a grower we had uh, early this spring before we had the second round of, let me, second round of uh, trials and we had a lot of interest. There's a lot of growers there. Um, Interesting. What we do. That might be somebody online. Okay. Okay, I got four minutes left. Okay, I'm almost done here too. Okay, so here just a little plug with my raspberry Nantahala. Um, it was a wonderful raspberry, tastes really good, late primocane fruity, not as high yielding as some of the other ones out there. Um, only can be grown in our mountains and other locations that are cooler. Um, Larger than heritage, Courtney, um, and also Caroline. Um, yields lower than Caroline. Um, it's just, you know, a nice berry, not, you know, anything's, you know, outstanding. It didn't really catch on in North Carolina. But doggone, if that thing that the uh, Bernie's people found out about it, and actually, I forget, who not who we went, but another small company picked it up, started producing it, started selling it to Bernie's, and they sell that thing for $16.99 a plant. It is very popular in Bernie's. And one of my friends and um, old colleagues, Chad Finn, said when he was a little kid, that's what he wanted. He wanted to have a variety available in the nursery catalogs. And he had you know, found out that if that was you know, the, the only thing he achieved in his career, he would be very happy. So I'm very happy that we got Nantahala. And they call it sweet repeat the Bernie's, but they do say it was Nantahala. Um, so lots of resources with the academic extension mostly. So there's production guides, data diagnostic tools. I had a blog that was really popular. I'm not able to do it as much anymore, but it was fun to do it while I could. Um, we have a portal in North Carolina too. Um, that you know, is an extension website basically for things. We develop, develop a pest management strategic plan. So it's good for uh, future grants and things. Um, we have pruning videos. We have crop profiles, budgets, IPM guides. Um, and maybe we'll have a long day um, Kane's Diagnostic Tool and Production Guide in the future. So I think that's it. Lots of students worked with me. Thank them all. Um, Ian, Ian Mel, I've got a shout out to him. He's a new technician working for me. He's a recent Cornell grad here. Yeah. So he's down working with me and Barry's and he's getting his hands in the in, in the field a little bit more than we had before. I think so learning field work. Um, lots of cooperators in my time. Thanks a lot to Jim Ballington, who was really uh, set up the stage for all the wonderful germplasm that I inherited because he was a germplasm aficionado. So we have some really interesting germplasm. The bottom slide here is the, the long cane team here. Um, Brian Jackson right here, Ricardo Hernandez, Lisa, uh, the budget woman there, and Josh Mays there. So you know, we have a nice team working on things. Lots of cooperators throughout time too, both private and public. 
um, lots of funding agencies to, um, and then last but not least, I am also, as I mentioned, director of the graduate programs. Um, great place to come. We have about 61 graduate students, 24 PhD, 23 MS, 14 MHS, which is equivalent to your yes. MPS. Yeah, so it's the terminal degree. You pay for it, but it's really a popular degree. And it's really boost up our enrollment. I mean, we have a lot of faculty. You know, I think 31 is conservative there. I can't quite nail down who was actually allowed to put to mentor graduate students, but something around on there. So we have everything from landscape, like this department or this section does. Um, landscape design to gene editing too. So we have a wide range of options of you know of things that you could be um, working in graduate school. So come talk to me. I'm happy to talk to you. I've got some flyers and um, talk to you too about things that you could do at NC State. It's swarming down there. You don't have to show the snow in the winter. It's really hot in the summer. Um, <laughs> got good barbecue. So it's a good place to live. I've been happy. And so any questions from anybody? Yeah. Folks in Virginia. Yeah. 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 Um, like different web, uh, sort of like climate uh, in the different regions, mm -hmm. and how that was more appropriate or less appropriate. Right. Um, and do you see any uh, like soil? Oh, absolutely. Like There's sand? way. Oh, yeah. So the eastern is mostly sandy. The Piedmont, we have these clay types. The mountains, they're rocky type, so yeah, and it's actually the, the soil profile of North Carolina is really beautiful. I, I don't know if you like soils, but it's like way different. So yeah, that's the whole big challenge. And actually, this these long canes would, uh, you know, alleviate all that trying to figure out how to grow in the soils and fertility issues too. So absolutely, we have lots of different soils that are kind of reflective of the zones too. How big are the containers that these long uh, canes come in, Mike? Yeah, I think they're eight, eight, eight inch. Eight inch, yeah. And, and they come with substrate in them from Quebec. They do, yes. So the, the shipping cost of those must be just crazy. It's not a cheap thing, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's what, you know, we're working on that budget. We'll see what that is. But then, I, you know, I did mention too, we're trying to develop an industry or there's a, 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 a nurseryman that works on other things, other crops up in the mountains too. So trying to develop a long cane industry there too. So I mean, it will be, be a whole lot less shipping if we were able to do right, that yeah. as well. Yeah, it's a very dynamic horticulture industry that has many cooperators there. Yeah. So, Gina, uh, a slightly different question. Sure. Uh, since you've worked in applied horticulture and kind of like developing an industry um, over a you know, long time now, what do, you, what do you see as some of the challenges and opportunities for working as like uh, extension faculty in an applied setting at North Carolina or just kind of at large in the land grant university. Like where, where do you see like, you know, some of the, this heading for doing this kind of uh, work? You know, I think you got to continue to reach out to the grower clientele. You know, if I was a new faculty or a new, yeah, new faculty going anywhere, just go around and meet the new people and see what they're going to do. I didn't necessarily do that because I knew we had methyl bromide issues. I knew that that was a, an issue that needed to be tackled and nobody was doing that in North Carolina. Um, so I knew that that's what I wanted to do with strawberries, and there was a lot of funding out there, um, and they were glad eventually that I did that. Um, for cane berries too, that I, I went around and talked to a lot of growers about that, and, and you know, asked them if they would be interested in growing blackberries. I just go around and talk to the uh, people. And my husband and I actually, when we first started in North Carolina, just got on the road and stopped at the research stations and at the grower locations and said, "Hey, we're here. You know, what are you? You know, what what's your problems?" Um, and by far right now still is labor issues. So, you know, we can develop cultural stuff. We don't have machines in North Carolina that I know of. But yeah, that's the thing. Ask, someone online has a question, just ask. Yeah, does anybody online have a question? I don't see ya. Great. Thanks, Gina. You're yeah, welcome. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.